This is Down the Line. Surf Talk Radio for San Diego. Brought to you by Coors Banquet, the surfer's beer, and by RISAutoInsurance.com. Now, here's Scott Bass and Marty Thomas. Yeah, guy. Welcome back. Welcome to the show. Down the Line Surf Talk Radio in San Diego. Welcome back. You've been here <laughs> since last Sunday, Bass. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm just drifting off here. I'm looking at my fantasy surfer team. I'm trying to figure out who to pick here. Rob Machado, Yaden Nickel, or uh, who's my other choice? You're Brett at, Simpson. You're looking at the uh, wild cards, huh? That's all I can afford. Well, Brett Simpson, uh, he could be. Uh, he could do some damage there. I've got to stay with Rob just because... Yeah. Rob's yeah, Rob. we were talking Rob's last, my buddy. I got to stick. Yeah, we Rob. were talking last week with uh, with Pat O'Connell, the team manager there at Hurley, and he was kind of dissing Rob. Kinda, well, he was just saying where his head's at right now. Yeah. You know, he's Rob's definitely a bit of a cruiser. Well, Marty, it is August thirty first. It's a beautiful Sunday. There's f- some fun waves out there. Um, you know, I want a quick show announcement. We're going to be on the air at seven o'clock in the morning next week, all through football season. So the show changing times instead of eight a.m. Sunday, it's seven a.m. Sunday. Every Sunday, and of course, podcast on iTunes. The key word there is search, so you can search all the shows on iTunes. And Marty, you and I are going to be at ASR on Thursday. That's right. Yeah, we're going to be Action doing Sports interviews. Retailer. That's right. San Diego Convention Center, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But we'll be there Thursday across from the Starbucks, so come by and say hi to Marty and I. Um, big show. Gosh, Fernando Aguirre, the president of the ISA, is going to be talking to us about the Olympics and surfing and where surfing stands and becoming an Olympic sport. Of course, we've got the top five surfing stories. We've got Cougar Duke. We've got Belly Up Tavern trivia. And if you don't, if you don't know it out there, but the, uh, Fer- Fernando is the founder of Reef. That's Reef, right. Uh, sandals and footwear. I, I want you to ask Fernando a question about when Peter King put that ad of him with the thong up his butt cheeks. <laughs> What Fernando thought of that? Because I heard he was pissed off. That was, a, was that a her, what, what kind of ad was that? It was a reef ad. It was what, a reef ad. I think so. And I think Peter might maybe got let go because of that <laughs> ad. So that's up to you, Marty. Are you going to have the chat spot to ask? Yeah, Fernando? I might go there. Okay, you better go there. Um, but you know what's the big news in the nation right now? It's Hurricane Gustav, and it's a. I think it's a Cat Three. It's in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's churning and. Uh, Of course, everyone's concerned for the state of Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, those Gulf states there. We're all worried about what's going to happen. But what's more important to surfers is that whenever there's a hurricane or a natural disaster, it's time to go surfing. That's right. Most people are fleeing the hurricane, but our uh, Surfer Magazine's Kevin Welsh is actually heading towards the hurricane. That's right. Oh, there we go. This is right off your iPod, isn't it? No, it actually isn't. I'm not a big Scorps guy. But Kevin Welsh is the senior staff photographer for Surfer Magazine, and I called Kevin this morning. We got him on the line, I think. Is he still there? Anyway, uh, you know, the thing about the thing about what we were talking about is, you know, like when there's a tsunami or there's an earthquake or something, I'm always the first one to head out to Indonesia, you know? It's like, okay, I mean, an earthquake in that area, yeah. you know? Because... Any, or even, you know, like down in Central America, it's it's like, look, when people are fleeing, that's the time to go show up because it's going to be uncrowded. Right. And generally, they're going to want our dollars well, the, spent there. The Gulf uh, Coast of Florida and, what is it, Texas, they don't get much surf in there unless there's a hurricane. I and mean, there has to be a, a strong, uh, you know, No, this isn't movement. a spot that many people have ever thought about going to go surfing, but uh, Kevin and the crew uh, on their way over there to surf Hurricane Gustav. Kevin Welsh, welcome to the show, man. Are you there? Mitch, can you patch Kevin in? Hey. Hello, hello. Hey, Kevin, you're on with Scott and Marty. Can you hear us? Hey, Scott. Hey, Marty. What's up? What's yeah, up? I can hear you. What's up, Welsh? It sounds like you're in the hurricane or uh, in the motorhome on the road. I'm in the motorhome on the road, hopefully staying on the road. Well, tell us, Kevin, what are your expectations? Uh, how far out are you from getting in the water, and what are you guys expecting surf-wise there on the Gulf of Florida? Probably uh, be showing up about... In about six hours, five hours. But uh, right now, I just got the report from some of the guys that are there, and there's nothing showing as yet. Uh, but the buoy um, about 200 miles south of Panama City is showing like 25 feet. So uh, it's the swell's coming. I'm, we're expecting it to uh, start hitting this evening. Wow, that's insane. So the interesting thing about that is that it's not going to be a long period swell. We're talking 25 feet at like eight second intervals. <laughs> it's going to be nonstop. Yeah, that's going to be crazy. I guess I'll just stay on the beach and uh, put a leash next to a palm tree so I don't go anywhere. 
Now, what about the conditions? Is it going to be offshore? I mean, you, you, you're fairly experienced in this type of situation. Whenever there's a hurricane in the Gulf of Consequence, you seem to zip over there. What can you tell us about conditions and, and uh, surf size and stuff like that? Yeah, what's good about the area where I'm going, uh, the Panama City area, um, it faces more like west-southwest. So with the east wind, um, they're expecting it to be, uh, you know, offshore over there, slight offshore, you know. But it's the wind's definitely going to be a factor. It's going to be uh, picking up. Right now it's only like 10, 15 uh, out of the east. But uh, by this evening uh, it probably should be picking up to like 20. Tomorrow they're expecting uh, maybe up to 25 to 30 possibly. So, uh, Welshie, what surfers are currently in town that you are going to be shooting? Uh, of course, uh, my main guy that I'm hooking up with is Sterling Spencer. Um, he's got the Gulf Coast wire. His uh, whole family's been, uh, you know, legendary from that whole uh, panhandle area. I just got off the phone with those guys, and uh, they're really anxious about it. But I also have, like, Cody and Evan Thompson from Jacksonville. They just drove down uh, from New Jersey with uh, Zach Humphreys. They were in that Oakley Pro Junior that just ended yesterday, uh, the uh, Brian Heritage Contest there with the uh, Junior Pro. That Corey Amardini just won, but um, yeah, we're just uh, you know who else do I have? Jesse Holland's going to be there. I know Shay and I believe Corey's floating around too uh, up there. They're doing their uh, missions and stuff. But uh, there's going to be a lot of really good talent. And um, the funny thing about that area too is, uh, man, when these hurricanes come out, they uh, people come out of the woodwork. Man, you'll see the good old boys, man, with their long beards and their mullets and pulling out boards <laughs> from like 1972. They all yellowed out, and uh, they'll be out there charging too, man. Well, that area, that area doesn't really get much surf unless there's a hurricane. I mean, it could go weeks and months without surf. Isn't that true? Um, no, that's incorrect. Really? Um, yeah, when a low comes across, um, you know, the plains and stuff, you'll get a, like a, uh, you'll get the southeast wind, you know, sucking up to the low, so you get a fetch in that uh, far from, uh, especially Pensacola, Panama City West all the way out to Pensacola and even, uh, you know, Dolphin Island and, you know, Alabama and those areas too. They'll get waves. Um, and then once the front passes by, you get the, uh, with the counterclockwise winds of the low, you'll get the offshore wind. So they do, they get better surf than most people really imagine up there in the panhandle. It's definitely the best spot for surf in the whole Gulf of Mexico, in my opinion. Well, Kevin, uh, we wish you the best of luck. Um, hopefully, maybe we'll get a report back from you next week. I'm sure we'll see your photos on Surfer Magazine, surfermag.com, and in Surfer Magazine. Best of luck to you, Kevin. Thanks for calling in, man. Hey, yeah, check this out. We have another hurricane on the East Coast, so it's going to be flip-flop. So right after uh, shooting gust off, we head over to the East Coast, and Hannah is now predicted to uh, head up along um, parallel to the Florida coast. Uh, so we're going to get one swell on the Gulf and then followed up by another one on the, on the Atlantic. So we're stoked. Very good. Back-to-back. Good stuff, Kevin. Thanks, man. Talk to you soon. Thanks, buddy. Bye. All right, Welshie. Now, they're going to get some surf, but it's important that we tell our listeners about the Surf Report powered by Surfshot.com and brought to you by Coors Banquet Beer, Marty. And it looks like today and Monday and Tuesday, gosh, yesterday was super fun. There's a little bit of south swell in the water. It's small, but it's a, it's a ground swell. So when it does show up, it shows up. Uh, It looks like both Monday and Tuesday, however, we're going to continue to see kind of this small-scale surf. However, Marty, there's some good news here. Uh, In the middle of the week, it looks like a better south swell, ground swell arriving in the San Diego region from 190, 200 degrees southwest. That's Wednesday and Thursday. Long period energy, and it's got a good westerly component, as I mentioned, so chest-to-shoulder high waves Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And um, even going out further, it looks like next Monday, Tuesday, um, some more solid southwest groundswell. So some stuff heating up down there uh, in the South Pacific off of uh, New Zealand. And Possible swell for the start of the uh, Boost Mobile Pro presented exactly, by Hurley. Exactly right. Possible swell for the Boost Mobile Pro presented. Get your fantasy teams together too, by the way. However, uh, real quick, Belly Up, ta- uh, Belly Up Tavern trivia. Are you ready for this? Rub Dub Fridays at the Belly Up Tavern. I've got six tickets here to the first caller, 570-1360. They can tell me the name of the surf spot that is directly south of Lower Trestles. Call right now, 570-1360, to win these six tickets to the Belly Up Tavern Friday night, September 12th, Rub-A-Dub Friday, the surf spot directly south of Lower Trestles. 570-1360, we're going to come right back with the top five stories. You're listening to the Down the Line Surf Talk Radio on Extra Sports 1360. Extra 
Sports. 1360. If it swells, ride it. You're listening to Down the Line. Live and local. Brought to you by Coors Banquet and RISAutoInsurance.com. Now, here's Scott Bass and Marty Thomas. Now, this is on your iPod for sure. Absolutely. Friggin' this is one of the, This is one of those songs that I don't ever hear or think about. When I hear it, I go, oh, man, that's a cool song. Isn't this a classic? Yeah. Right, up, right when I'm picking my fantasy surfer team for the Boost Mobile. Perfect. Dear Mr. Fantasy, yep. Stevie Winwood. Right Traffic. Now, right now I'm just loaded with uh, regular footers. Let me hear your team real quick. So far I got Kelly, Mick, Taj, and Dane. All right. You I got no throw. money left. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say good I luck. got four more spots to fill. <laughs> you can get yeah, like me and you for like 25 bucks. Um, <laughs> Fantasy Surfer. Lowers event starts next Sunday, so you're going to want to go to FantasySurfer.com and get your team going there. Every event they give away prizes, Surfer Magazine and – and the guys, uh, you know, what bums me out is that um, the only WCT event on the West Coast in the mainland USA, for that matter, is held during the same week as the Surf Expo or the Surf Trade Show. Well, that's true, but you know, the trade show is over Saturday, and the sh- event doesn't start till Sunday. So. Yeah, but I got to go to Florida on Wednesday for the Surf Expo. Oh, I'm sorry, Surf Expo. I thought in you Florida. Meant, uh, that does yeah. that is lame. Kind of bummer, huh? Once again, not good, brother. Uh, you know what? We got the top five stories. Now, Down the Line presents the top five stories. Marty, the number five story, of course, top five stories brought to you by Coors Banquet Beer and RIS Auto Insurance Pipes Cafe. Large Mondo burrito filled with eggs, cheese, avocado, bacon, sausage, snosage, salsa, all wrapped in a warm flour tortilla Pipes Cafe. Coors Banquet Beer, RIS Auto Insurance. Number five story, Marty, construction of a surf reef in the UK gets underway. Apparently, uh, there were cheers all around this week as they started dropping bags of stuff into the ocean to, to make stuff. Uh, you know, I don't know what it was. <laughs> bags of stuff. Uh, let's see here. Europe, Europe's first artificial surf reef. I'm reading from their press relief. Um, the barge was allowed to slowly winch along the reef side, allowing the section to gradually unfold and peel off into the water. Winches were then pulled down the reef onto the seabed and secured it into place. So, yeah, they're dropping these five ton anchors to make a surf reef in the UK. And I mean, that's got to be exciting stuff. If you're a UK surfer, British surfer, you got your own surf reef being made and perhaps it'll actually work. Well, is it in an area that gets swell and waves and what type of surf is there at the moment? Well, um, I imagine that they wouldn't build it anywhere where there wasn't swell, right? I don't know. I don't know the English coastline that well, but I'm sure they, they've got their act together well okay. enough. I'm looking at my notes. we got an artificial reef. Being built in the UK. It's about time. I, when are we going to get on that plan? Do we need an artificial reef? Uh, many would say we don't. Okay. I would argue that we do. We just I, need, we need I know more, we need one more than a, than a tall road. We need more <laughs> south swells. That's what we need. Yeah, I guess you're right. The number four story. Two million can't buy our surf, say Lennox Head Surfers in Australia. They're saying no to an international surfing contest, despite predictions that it would bring millions of dollars to the town of Lennox Head. Now, uh, Marty, you're familiar with Rip Curl Search, and so am I, and they apparently have th- thrown out the first sort of feelers to the yeah. community there about holding an ASPWCT event. At Lennox had a great you know, world-class wave, and looks like some of the uh, local community sort of sounding off. Now, I don't know if it's a vocal minority or if the majority of I surfers- guess there's 700 people signing off on the petition, and uh, Lennox Head's sort of uh, out in the bush or in the country, so to speak, you know, so they're probably against it. You know, they like the... The town and the the coastline the way it is, um, you know, it's a bit of a granola town type deal. So, right. You know, they're kind of over the idea of having a surf contest. Fair enough. Right. Well, you know, I, we've you and I both have sort of been preaching to the guys, uh, you know, that do the search that these third world countries are a little better than the first world countries. Yeah. You're going to meet guaranteed opposition. Um, but the third world countries, you know, pretty wide open. Yeah, so. There's plenty of good surf out there. There is. The number three story, Marty. The uh, WQS winds down today in Portugal, and San Diego's own Chase Stang. There's a live webcast of that going on right now. Oh, Marty. yeah, I didn't yeah. check that out. Chase Stang, San Diego's own. I don't know if you know Billy Stang, but uh, I grew up surfing with Billy Stang, a uh, guy who surfed at Pipeline and the legendary Swamis, Encinitas, Oceanside Surfer, and his son Chase Stang is uh, done well in this event, and he's not one that's like way up there on the WQS standing. So, uh, well, how's he doing? Big shout out to Shea Stang. I don't know. Pull up at ASP.com yeah, and see what you can right find now. out now. And um, Asher Nolan Marty won the East Coast Surfing Championships 
And did you know that Asher Nolan, we've had him on the show, Marty, and Asher is John Reinhardt's son-in-law mm-hmm. of Reinhardt Insurance Services, our big one of our biggest sponsors. Oh, so that's right. Congrats to Asher and to John and Patty Reinhardt. So um, good stuff for, for those guys. Got anything going there with the WQS? Oh, well, I see Pat Godowskis is into the semis. What, what about we... Chase Stang? Did he already lose out? Uh, Chase Stang, yeah, he got uh, he lost out in the quarters. But Still, that's a great result. Oh, great for him. result. That's um, sixteen hundred and twenty five points and twenty six hundred bucks. And a lot of great experience under his belt too. So congratulations to Chase Stang. Now Patrick Godowskis, he's making a move. Here. Oh, Godowskis is qualified. Yeah. He's currently uh, he's in the first semi up against Hector Alves. Who else in, uh, from the USA is looking solid in that event? Anybody? Uh, everyone, no, no. Okay, yeah. so yeah. money's on Patrick. Oh, Phil McDonald, Phil Macca, he's in the semis. Yeah, yeah he fell, he's in Australia. Yeah, he fell off the tour. He's having to go to get back on there. Yeah. The number two story: Stephanie Gilmore, Rip Curl's own, won the Rip Curl Pro Mademoiselle and takes the ASP Women's Ratings lead away from Lane Beachley. I don't think Lane ever had it, but. The defeating of fellow finalist Lane Beachley in clean one to three foot waves at Les Bourdons. Les Bourdons. In Segonou. Seigneurs. Seigneurs. And regaining the ratings lead in the hunt for the 2000 uh, ASP world title. So, Stephanie, back to back world titles, possibly. possibly. She's making a run there. There's only a couple more events left. I think there's only six or seven events on their circuit. You know, that has been like a four month gap between Bells and this event. Well, I ran into a bunch of the pro girls out in Indonesia when I was on my trip. Okay, I'll, they got uh, a pretty good setup. They. They're getting paid good money these days, and they surf about seven events a year. Get a lot of downtime. They go surf, travel, and do you know fun well, trips. The big, um, the the big Roxy Pro Jam, Linda Benson longboard things at Cardiff here in a couple of weeks, and a lot of I know I surf with Jen Smith, the world longboard uh, champion from last year, and Cassie Med are out. In fact, we're going to try to get them on the show here soon. You going to surf in that event? I am. I'm going to surf in the. Uh, nice. I'm going to surf in the amateur women's division. And, Marty, the number one story, a question to you, Marty Thomas. Jerry Lopez, Rob Machado, Brad Gerlach, Joel Tudor, Pat O'Connell, Mike Hinson, Wingnut, Robert August. What do these men have in common, Marty? They're all attending sacred craft. That's absolutely correct. I can't believe you. <laughs> do I win you, anything? <laughs> you do. You do. I'll, I don't know what it is. But Sacred Craft, October 11th and 12th at the Del Mar Fairgrounds. All of those legends and more are going to be there. Um, looking forward to a big event at oh, having Lopez Craft. there. I mean, that's I mean, Lopez is just he is the master of style. He is. He's a style master. I can't I guess I can't say it any better than that. Master style. And he'll be there signing books and uh Wingnut and Robert August are going to be there doing it. Great to see Lopez shape aboard. I'm I'm trying. <laughs> Believe me, I am trying. Are you kidding? That'd be that'd be insane. I am trying. I yeah. So we'll see what happens now. Also, Delmar Fairgrounds, the Commerce Department meeting the TCA, remember the TCA, the people that want the toll road at Trestles, they have appealed the Coastal Commission decision to the Commerce Department. Mm-hmm. Now, the Commerce Department says, okay, let's have a public forum meeting. Again? and Yes, again, where basically everyone lines up and says the same stuff they said before. And that's going to happen September 22nd at the Del Mar Fairgrounds. Cool. So I wonder, you seeing how the last one went, where, I mean, they were outnumbered, I don't know. 50 yeah. to 1, 100 to 1. You know, there's a massive marketing push by the TCA. You got to, as you know, when you build a freeway, all that land next to the freeway, which is owned by multimillionaire yeah. developer guys, that land was worth a lot of money if you can get that freeway approved. So they're going to put a lot of dough into this whole deal. Think and, of all the, like, the little mini shopping malls and things that'll pop up. I mean, on their side of it, you're going to get like mayors from Inland Empire's pl- places, yeah. like mayors from Mission Viejo, mayors from Irvine, and mayors from wherever, Anaheim. They're all going to get up there in their suit and tie and explain how See great See how the last uh, meeting went? I'm sure they're going to have a lot more people there this time around. I agree. It's going to, yeah. We got to get the word out there. I know. Well, that's we what we're to- doing. Yeah. Circle the wagons, man. Circle the wagons. And to, to to get your time in front of the Commerce Department Commission, you have to do a formal. You can't just show up. You have to send them a letter that explains mm-hmm. who you are and what you want. So there's a little bit of a bureaucratic process. So anyway, September 22nd, uh, surfers that want to save trestles rally around that date. All right, Marty, we got to take a quick break. We're going to come back with Fernando Aguirre, the ISA uh, president, and we're going to talk about surfing and the Olympics and the viability of that. So... Stay with us for a great interview coming up here. You're listening to the Down the Line Surf Talk Radio in San Diego on Extra Sports 1360. Extra Sports! 
1360. Hey, how's it going? I'm Asher Nolan, and you are listening to Down the Line Surf Talk Radio on Extra Sports 1360. Surfing is not a group hug. You're listening to Down the Line. Live and local. Brought to you by RISAutoInsurance.com on Extra Sports 1360. Yeah, guy. Welcome back down the line. Surf Talk Radio in San Diego, August 31st. Marty Thomas and his Wrinkled Surfer Magazine t-shirt sitting to my right. And I'm your host, Scott Bass. We've got these Belly Up Tavern tickets. Rub It Up Fridays at the Belly Up Tavern with Justin James. Justin James is a guy I know. He's a surfer. Uh, anyway, September 12th. Call right now, 570-1360 if you want the... the uh, these tickets, these six tickets, of course, you'll have to answer a trivia question. Best of luck to you. Anywhere in San Diego, 570-1360. Marty, we got Kook or Duke going on. Kook or Duke. Now it's time. Kook or Duke. This Kook or Duke. is Kook or Duke. Kook or Duke. Marty, my Kook is the guy that basically, <laughs> well, he broke into my car. Um, Friday, stole my passport, my wallet, my credit cards, ran up $300 worth of stuff. He paid, the guy paid his T-Mobile bill with my credit card. That was kind of a stupid move. No, you, you think somebody could hunt him down? You think now. they could uh, track that one? Yeah, call him up. So anyway, I was in the, I was, uh, LJ Richards pulled up next to me at Cardiff. He rolled down his window. I rolled down my passenger window, and we were chatting for about an hour or so about the Duke Festival and Waikiki and various other things, and and then we saw a good set come in, and we are like, let's go. We're out there. And so we suited up, and we went out there, and I left my passenger window down. And somebody, a crime of opportunity perhaps, Marty, this guy went in there, grabbed my wallet, grabbed my passport, which is really kind of freaking me out. And so I've been in, um, you know, uh, sort of, you know, deal with it mode, trying to get my bank's accounts closed and passport canceled and driver's license and all that stuff. So that guy's my kook along with you got two kooks. I've got two kooks along with all of the professional men stand up paddlers at the Duke <laughs> festival that let Candace <laughs> Appleby, the women win that event. Now I have nothing against women surfers or women winning, but I'm saying that you've got to be a kook. She if, won if fair and square. Man. I mean, come on. These are the best stand up paddlers in the world. And have Kansas. you seen any photos or video from that? Well, event I yet? called those guys. Cause yeah. I said, Hey, this is either the greatest marketing move you've ever done in your life, or you guys are really blowing it. And they're really, <laughs> And then I realized they're not that smart to market women in their sport that well. So, so she did, in fact, win, and she, yeah. she won the event. She won. Of course, they're all complaining about the judges and how small the waves were and yada, 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 but whatever. All right. Well, my kook is uh, the UH Warriors for getting blown out by uh, Florida Gators yesterday. You know, oh. They went like 15-1 and one last year, and they lost to uh, Georgia. College football. The yeah, Warriors yeah. lost yeah. to Florida. But they did have to travel. Like you said, five to six thousand miles from uh, Hawaii to Florida to play that in that uh, that game. So unfortunately for them, they uh, lost out. Yeah. Well, guess who we got on the phone now? So yeah, Fernando. We got some President Olympic movement the, going right. on here. How's that? I love that. How's that? That's a powerful song, right? Isn't there. that? That's kind of a tearjerker. Yeah. That's a tearjerker. You, just, you can picture American athlete up at the podium with their gold medal and tears yeah, in their eyes just welling in their eyeballs uh, on the phone now fernando gary the isa president and he's here to talk marty with you and i about olympics and serving fernando welcome to the show how are you guys doing we are doing well fernando now uh how about that olympic uh i guess it's a march D- does that uh, bring some emotion into you uh fernando i think it always does to everybody i mean regardless of what sport you practice it's just like a the, the get together of all people a lot of sport. Fernando, if and when surfing becomes an Olympic sport, I imagine when you hear that march, you're probably going to shed a tear. I'm sorry, I, I just lost you the last uh, part of, this, of the question. No problem. Yeah, we're right here. I was just saying that if and when a surfing becomes an Olympic sport, Fernando, you're probably going to well up with pride and the tear may be shed, my friend. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, that's like the last thing that, that that I think about. I think about, uh, you know, the Duke uh, almost 100 years ago swimming for gold and telling the IOC, 1920, guys, you got to bring surfing in. I mean, remember that the Olympics initially were, most of the sports were a way uh, of, uh, of not waging war. I mean, the Olympics were created in a time in which the world was in a very, very uh, crazy and violent state of mind. Sounds familiar? Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that thing that happens a, a little over a hundred years ago was uh, 
No, there were some sports. You know, that's why we have archery and shooting and riding horses. There were mainly activities performed by the military guys. I mean, the the regular people they didn't have time nor money to, to spend on, on practicing sports. They were barely making uh, ends meet. So sport was a pastime of, of rich people, really. And that's why they used to be amateur. Amateur in Latin means for love. So that means if you do it for money, you're a sellout. And if you do it for love, you're a gentleman or a lady. I knew there was a reason you were involved, Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Fernando. There is, there, is, there is a lot of reasons that touch my heart. And, um, and um, one of them is, is uh, of course, getting the recognition for the sport. But, you know, you guys and I, we have to agree that surfing is not about competition. Competition is just a, a small piece of the sport. It's, it's kind of like a marketing of the sport or what we like to do once in a while. But really, the, the pleasure of surfing doesn't have much to do with competing against somebody and making the judge happy. So, Fernando, I mean, is the IOC making a, you know, are they looking at surfing and are they, you know, currently considering adding surfing? Well, the way, you know, the, as you know, the IOC is like a, a, a very traditional old men's club. And, you know, they have made big efforts in incorporating ladies and they have big efforts in making a, less of a country club and more of an open club. And the last decade we've seen snowboarding coming into the Olympics. Uh, we saw BMX or at least part of BMX. Uh, at the uh, Olympic Games uh, in Beijing. So I think there's a big... Uh, they would really love to have surfing and skateboarding. And the biggest problem is that skateboarding doesn't have any uh, national federations or international federation structure. It's a sport that resists a lot that type of, uh, of organization. And in the case of surfing, while we do have all those uh, national federations like Surfing America in the U.S. and the ISA, it's a, it's a challenge for them. It's a challenge to have the sport... Um, uh, practice at the, uh, the competitions at the Olympics away from the host city. I mean, it, it, it is not as hard as it used to be. Like, you had Beijing, you had soccer, you got sailing, you got a lot of things that were not in, in, in Beijing, they were in Shanghai, So, which is two hours flight, so it's far away. Right. So, uh, so I think, you know, that, that obstacle is not really... The other obstacle traditionally inside the Olympics was... Well, it's a sport that the, the winner is decided by a subjective uh, judgment of a panel of judges. So what? I mean, last time I checked, almost every sport has a judge and in some cases make a lot of uh, very polemical decisions. Uh, so, but, but as you know, that could also be uh, improved uh, big time. Now, Fernando, if, uh, if surfing were to get into the Olympics, um, would we see the best surfers competing? I mean, how is the current yeah, relationship not, with the ASP? And, uh, you know, let's say, you know, if, if the U.S. put a team out there, you know, are we going to see, you know, Kelly Slater? Are we going to see the best well, surfers guys, on the team? Is, you know, there's, there's a two, two prone approach. The first approach is that it needs to be open to them. The Olympics used to be for amateurs over 24 years ago. That has changed. So right now the Olympics wants the best athletes in the world. And some of those, you know, the, uh, the Kobe's, you know, the, the Messi's, whatever, those guys are, you know, they make, you know, tens of billions of dollars a year, and they're in the Olympics in their team. But, but uh, four years ago, the Dream Team of basketball didn't take the, bring the best guys, and Argentina won the gold. This time, the Dream Team went full on, and America got the gold. So I think it has to do with, is it possible? Yes. The ISA has a great relationship with ASP? Yes. The ASP is a member of, of a voting member of the ISA, and... and so that's not really the problem. The Olympics like to see they they like to see that the pro leagues, as they call, uh, like the ATP of tennis or the ASP of surfing, are in good terms with the international federation, which is in this case the I say That's a fact that happens all the time. Now, Fernando, a um, couple of things. I read your opinion on the Olympics and surfing, and it was very well stated. You mentioned that. To get a new sport into the Olympics, they sort of, well, they do have to prune an old sport. And pruning an old sport means basically clipping one of the members that's been a member for a long time out of the club. Um, for, yes. for surfing to get in, what old sport do you think we should eliminate? For instance, I saw pistol shooting this year in the Olympics. Guys, guys, I think it's, you have to realize this. there are some sports that only exist because they get money from TV rights from the Olympics. Right. I was, I mean, nobody practices. No, I wouldn't say nobody because somebody's going to get offended, but I think there's like maybe ten or 15,000 people in the world that practice modern pentathlon. You know, they're riding horse, uh, horses, shooting, archery, swimming, and, and, and running. I right. mean, really, how many people can afford to do that? It's really an all-discipline or a 
it's like a like a like the sports uh, like the triathlon of of armies a hundred years ago. That's what modern pentathlon is. Right, right. Uh, and and the reason it exists, you know, they have some federations that are very weak. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they have ten members. So in reality, the guys that are in is like you know they don't want to get out because if they leave, they're gone. The sport will disappear. I mean, I know there's a lot of people in the audience that practice uh, tennis table and badminton. But, excuse me, you know, is, that a, <laughs> is, is, that, is that a youth sport or a sport that's going to get rating up? Yeah, I got all sweaty watching badminton. Last time. <laughs> well, so, we would agree with you, perhaps. They know that. Listen, the IOC knows that, but it's a, it's a very convoluted. It's like a constitutional amendment in the United States Constitution. It's long, has a lot of requisites. It will happen. And then most importantly, I think, the world uh, passion for, for, uh, for action sports is behind, our, is behind us. You know, we're, we're in the right path. Right. Some of the other sports, there's nothing they can do. I mean, they're trying to figure out. Uh, just a short list for 2016 is uh, rugby, which is going to be rugby seven. It's a fun sport to watch. Then it's going to be rocket ball. Okay. Then it's going to be roller sports. A roller sport might include skateboarding. That's why the Olympics might might be looking with a keen eyes to inclusion of roller sport, which is like roller blade racing and and, and the traditional four four wheel skates, and of course skateboarding. And then it's um, golf. Okay, I don't think, I don't think Tiger is going to go to the Olympics, but anyhow, these guys might think so. And, and you know, I don't think the showing forty year old men. Uh, Playing golf with a 15 pound of our weight, even if they are the best golfers in the world, is going to make it. Yeah, and they, they already have an international event anyway. So the 2016 yeah. games, you mentioned the short list for new sports, rugby, karate, roller sports, racquetball, and golf. When are we going to see I, surfing? I when are we going to see surfing, Fernando, on the short list? Well, there are two things that, that, that can happen. The first thing is that, you know, the next short list is only for 2020, 100 years after the Duke asked, asked for it. Right. That's one thing. The other thing that can happen is that the rules change. The rules of how a new sport is involved, how an old sport. There are right now set amount, percentage amount of votes at the IOC meeting next year to decide which sport is going to be included. They might not include any. And baseball and uh, softball are gone from London, so they're trying to get back. Right. But, of course, baseball and softball is you know, it's a sport practice in America and a few Caribbean states. And Japan, so it doesn't look very well. Yeah. Then we got um, the actual uh, decision-making process. If they change the numbers, let's say that in order to remain an Olympic sport, you need to get 75% of the votes. Then a lot of these sports are not going to make it. Yeah. Because right now the rule says that in order to stay, if you're inside, you only need 50% of the votes of support. If you are outside, in order to get in, you need 75% of the vote. So the rules are different if you are inside the club than if you are outside the club to get in. Here's the deal, Fernando. we got to take all these IOC decision makers to Tavarua for a week. Yeah, either that or, <laughs> or I think, you know what, the beauty of this is there is a new leadership at the IOC. There's a lot of young people like this. The two gentlemen that are in charge of, um, of uh, Singapore, the Olympic Youth Games in 2010. Yeah. First one, the inaugural. Uh, one last the the surfing, he's a snowboarder. Yeah. The other one is a French surfer. Oh, so very it's good. not like I was. It's not like I, we were used to talk to all these old guys that thought that surfing was, you know, the guy with the rope behind the boat or whatever. They didn't have any idea. <laughs> now they do, and they watch it, and they like it, and they like, you know, to see uh, the, the, how uh, cinematographic and how uh, drastic and extreme the sport is. They really love that. Hey. So for them, it's almost. It's almost like not that we are against, let's call it the management of the IOC, really likes us. It's the whole process to get in. Right. It's, uh, it's just screwed up. So the it's, first uh, step of them liking us, we've pretty much taken care of that. Now we just got to deal with the bureaucratic hurdles. Fernando, please hang on. We got to take a break, but I want to come back and talk to you some more about this. You're listening to Down the Line Surf Talk Radio on Extra Sports 1360. Thirteen sixty. Down the line, Surf Talk Radio, putting a dash of salt into your morning cup of joe. Brought to you by RISAutoInsurance.com. This is Extra Sports thirteen sixty. 
the greatest rock and roll band of all time, the Rolling Stones. And by Absolutely. the way, I think the greatest album of all time, Exile on Main Street. Uh, Marty, we're on the phone. We're talking Olympic surfing with Fernando Aguirre, the president of the ISA. And Fernando just went over some stuff with us. You know, they've got the IOC decision makers on board. The IOC sees the power of youth sports. They see the X Games and they go, wow, look at that marketing machine. How do we get them involved? And Fernando wrote a great editorial uh, about the Olympics and surfing and where we stand. And and um, one of the things that Fernando and Fernando, welcome back, by the way. One of the things that Fernando states is that um, wave parks and the building of wave parks, the construction of wave parks throughout the world will help kind of attack some of these hurdles at the IOC um, that we have to get over to get the surfing in the Olympics. Fernando, what are your thoughts on the wave parks? I think wave parks are it's a little bit like before and after for surfing. It's a... Um uh, well, some uh, purists might look at wave parks, oh, my God, wave parks. Well, you know what? We used to play soccer only on the dirt or on the grass, and the same with tennis. And, you know, now nobody complains that there is cement or plastic courts for tennis. So it's, it's uh, just a different um, uh, interpretation of the sport. So I think it's going to be great. One of the things that I do like about wave parks is their ability to, uh, to generate waves that are really going to be Basically, you can just say, okay, this is going to be a competition on left, now we're going to have a competition on right, and now we're going to have a competition on shallower waves, whatever. The so we can really um, create a medium for the sport. And then the, the lack, as uh, the wave, but you didn't get the wave in your head, is gone. You know, how many times you're watching a serving and say, oh, yeah, you know what, I didn't get that wave that I needed. So, well, buddy, you know what, everybody got every wave that you needed. If you didn't get it, it's <laughs> that's a good one. Than the other Every contest I've ever been in, I didn't get the wave on you. Yeah, you know what? I was, you know, he was lucky. I was unlucky. I was just sitting there waiting, and it just didn't count. Okay, buddy. Well. Hey, for the record, I was in a contest with Fernando at the UCSD Luau a couple of years ago. Fernando got every wave in the heat, man. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit disappointed in you. Hey, another thing about wave parks that I want you to discuss is the economic feasibility of these things, Fernando. They can build them, but they haven't built them because it's just not work, doesn't work out on a spreadsheet. What are your thoughts about that? No, I think you know it's it's like saying that you know let's say that we're in 1890 and somebody says, yeah, you know this this thing, these cars don't work. You know, the only thing we will that work are railroads. You know, these cars are never going to work. There's no place to drive them. I say, well, you know, that was then. So I think what we need to look is at who runs them, how they run them. You know, I mean, a baker could be a great shop, but it could be a terrible business, depending who is the baker and who is the business behind it. So I think... got to be a visionary, to right, Fernando? you got to be well, a visionary. You need a visionary and you need somebody that knows what they're doing. If... I believe that if the only thing you got to do is just build a wave park in the middle of, now, uh, of nowhere and charging tickets and waiting for the ticket uh, buyers to arrive and make money with that, mm, I'm not sure. But if you're going to be building the wave park in the middle of a place that has a lot of different uh, elements, may that be you know, retail, uh, uh, sh- uh, like a shopping mall yeah, yeah. or a sports center or you know, like, a, like a rec center of a city, whatever, then it's a completely different animal. And I think we're looking more at that. So, as you know, sports by themselves are not very profitable. I mean, building a a soccer court on a two-acre land in the middle of a nice neighborhood, you can make a lot of money doing something else. But by building that, then people are going to have, you know, they're going to be building houses around the same right. with a golf course. Right. I mean, a golf course, if you look at the cost of the land of the actual golf course, is ridiculous. Yeah. But you sell the land to, to people that want to buy houses or, or want to build houses around, and that's the business of the golf course. So the business of the golf course is not the 50, 20, or 100 bucks you pay when you play. It's yeah. a completely different business model. Fernando, I got a question for you. We're running up against the clock here, but there must be a date on your calendar, and I know you don't like to look forward. You're just trying <laughs> to deal with the first and foremost questions that need to be dealt with. But there must be a date on your calendar that you secretly have circled somewhere that, that says, you know what, this is the date that the surfing is going to be in the Olympics. And I've circled the date 2024, and I want to know what your thoughts are on that date. I think, the, I think uh, my mine is in 2020, and I'm very, very confident because 2020 gives me five years if the rules are not changed, absolutely no change. But meanwhile, you know, we've been talking with organizing committees of Singapore and London Games to have some sort of weight park because they're building weight parks in those areas anyhow, regardless of what the Olympics do. Right. As part of the Olympic uh, cultural education slash entertainment program, let's remember that London is the youth games and they want to turn you know, uh, the games in relevant to youth around the world. 
So 2020 is a very likely day. You know, on, on the other hand, I think it's a, it's not a small element. It's like some of the older guys that didn't like surfing, didn't care about surfing, they're gone. And eventually, I'm younger than most of them, so it's a matter of surviving. So I survive, I might convince the other people. Right, right, right. Well, Fernando, uh, we applaud your efforts. Um, we really... Uh, Appreciate. I know the industry appreciates um, all the hard work that you put in, and, and Marty and I appreciate you coming on the show, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you soon. All right, Fernando. Thank you guys. All right, so Fernando Geary there on the phone. Um, certainly passionate guy. Gotta uh, love that Latin passion. Man. Yeah, he's into it. He's a funny guy, too. Yeah. <laughs> I Very guess... successful businessman. I mean, he and his brother basically started Reef Footwear, you know, yeah. from the ground up. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Santiago is his brother, yeah. and yeah. And, um, you know, a, a colorful character, to say the least, if you've never seen Fernando and some of the garb that he puts on. I know that he was dressed to the hilt at the Waterman's, Waterman's. Ball. What did he have on? Some, He's... like, Peruvian Inca outfit from, like, you know, 4,000 years ago or something. <laughs> I don't know where he dug the thing up, man. <laughs> oh, the guy's Probably weird. robbed some tomb or something to get that outfit, but it was epic. That's funny. Well, we got these Belly Up Tavern tickets, too, and we've had callers, but we they didn't hang on because we were on the phone with Fernando. So 570-1360, anywhere in San Diego, call now for the Belly Up Tavern tickets, uh, September 12th. Uh, Pine Mountain Logs with Justin James. That's September 12th. We've got six tickets right here, 570-1360. Give us a call. Now, Marty, um, fantasy surfer-wise, I wanted to throw some names at you. Ben Bourgeois, should I put him on my team? Um, I don't know. I mean, he hasn't had the best year. Um, could be a breakthrough, breakthrough event for him. You know, a bit risky, probably. Risky. What yeah. about uh, Chris Ward? There's a, there's like an all or nothing. Well, Wardo, I mean, it's his backyard. If the waves are good, he gets on a roll. I mean, he could win the event. He just came off uh, third, I think, at uh, the search there in Indo. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely. I think Wardo, I mean, what's he cost? Around five mil or six mil? I'm not sure what his number is, but Wardo is a guy that I would definitely consider. He's kind of like... You know he's he's so risky. Yeah. He's either going to bomb in the first round or he's going to make it at least to the semis. You know, and so I think. But at he's this stage, fit and healthy right now, obviously. You know, um, and he's coming off a good result, coming to his hometown, so he could uh, he could do some damage. Hey, I've got an email here by the way, Surf Talk San Diego at gmail dot com. That's the Coors Banquet Beer inbox. Surf Talk San Diego at gmail.com. Shoot us an email. I got one here that says, Hey, Scott and Marty, great show. Really appreciate Marty's input and insight into the show. Uh, it seems like sometimes you kind of piss Marty off, Scott. What's going on with that? Keep up the great show. I listen to your iPod. I listen to you via I my podcast on iTunes. Thanks again, Ralph. So I don't know. Thanks, have, Ralph. Have I been pissing I you off? You've been pissing me I don't off. Know, maybe. Just good open debate, I guess, on some yeah, fun exactly. surf topics. Exactly right. Well, um, let's see, Marty. Looks like we're getting down here to the end of the show. So we we had our kooks. We didn't do our dukes. And oh yeah, who's my your duke? duke is Midget Smith, uh, oh, who recently passed away uh, oh, due to cancer right. and legendary surfer from San Clemente. Affected so many people in a positive way. Um, great shaper, great surfer. Um, was a judge, you know, from the amateur level all the way to the pro ranks, and uh, just an awesome individual. So we we. We lost a legend last week. That's a, that's a great one, and uh, I think we're going to have a special um, trophy, a Midget Smith trophy, a shaping trophy at the Sacred Craft Consumer Surfboard Expo. Maybe some of his boards, too. It would be rad. Yeah, at some point we'll honor him. Yeah, I mean, Aki, this, you this, said last week, Aki won on his uh, one of his boards, yeah, the OP Boat Trip Challenge. That's right. Exactly right. So my Duke is going to be uh, all the people that come to Sacred Craft, <laughs> <laughs> October 11th and 12th at the Delmar Fairgrounds. So now that Sacred Craft's been the number one story this week, where is it next week? Number one, eh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks so much for listening to Down the Line Surf Talk Radio with Marty Thomas and Scott Bass. Until next week, adios. Yeah, we'll see you next week. Broadcasting from the Murray Lambert Construction Studios. Extra Sports! KLSD San Diego. San Diego's sports station.